All right, welcome to another Conscious Builder Live. And on today's episode, we have Peter Darlington and Tyler Hermanson on the show. Guys, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're, we're going to dig into Peter's home, which is the first certified home under CHBA's Net Zero Renovation Program, uh, which is exciting. So we'll get into, we got some pictures to show and all sorts of content to get into. Uh, but Peter was has been in construction since 1996, where he started with Stucco and the Building Envelope. But four years later, he started his own company called Peter's Exterior Contracting. And in 2014, Peter became accredited as a certified passive house consultant and soon after founded Solar Homes, Inc. in order to offer contracting and consulting services to those looking to reduce their environmental footprint. And Tyler, who's here, has worked on the house, did all the energy advising. He's been involved in the construction industry since playing under his father's drafting tables as a child, a designer, consultant, and certified energy advisor. He's been designing, testing, and consulting with Alberta builders since 2005. So based in Calgary in 2008, he started Four Elements Integrated Design, and Tyler has taken his family's design firm portfolio into a fully environmental direction, facilitating better building practices and performance through design advice, consulting, and certification across Western Canada. So uh, that's impressive for both of you guys. So we got lots <laughs> of knowledge. Awful. So hopefully we can get some good questions too. So let's just start actually, how did, how did you two meet? Well, we met through, um, I believe, the CHBA council that we both sit on uh, regarding the net zero renovations, and we were involved in the uh, first CHBA net zero uh, council for new construction. Yeah, I think the CHBA kind of said, hey, you guys really need to talk because Peter's got a cool house, and I think we can label it, and uh, away we go. So you two, like... Where, where did the interest actually, Peter, let's start with you. Like where did the interest for sustainability or having to build to a net zero standard come from? Oh, well, it was actually kind of a fluke. Um, we were going to be renovating the exterior of my house and I needed a double garage in my backyard. And while I was doing all the planning for this, I stumbled across a website called heat spring and they do a lot of efficiency um, kind of training. And that just kind of led me down the road where I realized, well, the renovation I'm already doing for, you know, like an extra 40 or 50 K I could basically supply all the energy I would need for the life of this building. How old is the building? Uh, it's a mid eighties originally. Uh, okay. The renovation was done in 2015. Cool. We'll get into some of those details. So then, so what originally tweaked your interest was more the energy savings portion of it uh, or was it a cost thing or just more an investments thing or w what was that initial interest that got you? Yeah, I, it really was kind of the cost, the operating costs, try to get my numbers down as low as you can. Um, especially in Calgary, we have really a very boom and bust kind of cycle here. So when it's bust, I'd like to be paying as little as possible for keeping my house running. Yeah. <laughs> And Tyler, what about yourself? You know, why, like, it sounds like your family's been in the industry. So what did your dad do? Uh, my dad was a designer for 30 years, uh, ran his own design shop here and, and did a lot of big custom houses, the, the least energy efficient homes, you know, we did in the eighties and nineties, right? We just weren't thinking about that then. And when I, uh, and I swore I would never go into the business and yet, uh, you know, halfway through university, I was like, you know, I might be good at that. Maybe I'll leave. Uh, my my BA and go do uh, to go do uh, construction and design and I actually started working for a builder that was building R two thousand homes as my summer gig and my and my work gig and he was so passionate about energy efficient building and I started to pick that up and uh, you know led me down the road that way so yeah so for for the listeners and viewers now uh, maybe just share a little bit of what R two thousand is versus net zero we're going to get into kind of the nitty gritty stuff of what happened with the house, but what would be the difference between all of the performance standards? I mean, I often talk about it as a road, right? You're going down the road from code minimum that you, the legal minimum you have to build and you get more and more efficient as you go down the road. And R2000 is our oldest green building program from the eighties. And it was trying to get houses, um, you know, 20%, 50% more efficient uh, then um, and really started it off. You know, now we have, 
programs like Energy Star and Bill Green that'll get you 10% better. And but net zero is really the end of that road because you're a hundred percent better, right? You've covered a hundred percent of your energy demand and you have this very efficient home. So one of the things that I've always had conversations with people about is the, you know, renovating a house and it's trying to find that sweet spot, right? And I find like technology is getting so good that eventually solar panels are going to be so good that every house could be net zero. It doesn't matter how efficient it is. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a comfortable home, uh, but potentially you can offset your electricity costs. You know, where, where do you see things going or what are, are, are people still focused on the, the energy cost? Because the people I talk to aren't, um, they're, they're more focused. It's, it's a different they're focused on the comfort, right? Health, right? But the energy costs kind of a bonus, right? So they do want to be efficient, but I don't really take the conversation that way because it's really hard to make a financial case for it unless they're planning on staying in the house for a long period of time. So where are you seeing the trend and, and what are your thoughts on kind of where things are going? Yeah, I agree. It is tough to sell, you know, like a cost analysis proposition to a customer. Um, and the bulk of the people coming to me are looking for emissions reductions primarily, uh, comfort, and then lowered bills is also, you know, a definite add bonus to, to that. But a lot, of, a lot of young families that are specifically looking for emissions reductions. And yeah, so, think, sorry, go ahead, Tyler. You know, a lot of our clients don't know the terminology, don't know the programs or the labels or certifications, but they just, they know they don't want code minimum. They want the house to be comfortable and smart. They want to make smart choices. And that starts leading us down this path. Yeah, that's that's good to hear, right? Because I always tell people you're going to vote with your wallet, right? Whatever you're going to spend money on, there's going to be more of that, right? So uh, the fact that they're thinking that way is great because that's when other things are going to start coming down, like heat pumps and so, like that technology. The more we buy it, the, the cheaper it will become because we can it'll be produced at a larger scale, right? So that's that's nice to hear. I think that the West is definitely further. Well, I know the West is further ahead than us over here in the East, uh, but there are some great projects going on over here as well. So uh, how many, like, I know you've worked on Peter's house together. Have you been working on many other projects together? Well, we've done at least another half dozen together, I would say. Um, yeah. And some pretty deep, deep retrofits. Um, one property that's very close to net zero. Um, a couple that are very close. And then we've got another one starting in a couple of weeks that will make net zero. Oh, nice. So, so what's the process? Like when somebody reaches out to you, are they reaching out saying, I want to make my home net zero? Or are they just saying, I want to do something and then you work with them to figure that out? Uh, you know, how, how does the process work for you? I, I am very specified in that I, you know, we're focused on doing net zero renovations as much as possible. Um, so typically a customer will come to us and they'll be looking for multi-year plans so that when they do their windows or they do their walls, that all these kind of pieces fall into place so that you have a five or 10 year plan at the end of the, uh, the road. When your mechanical systems die, you replace them with smaller systems because you've improved the building envelope. So would you have tips for people like starting out? What, where would you recommend that they start? You know, I've had a lot of these conversations with people too, right? They, they might take the low hanging fruit, but then they end up kind of shooting themselves in the foot uh, mm -hmm. because they do it in the wrong order. Yeah. For us, it's always building envelope first, try to get that heating requirement as low as possible. And then you design all the heating systems, the mechanical ventilation and the solar systems around that very low um, heat demand. Uh, that being said, though, like things like don't go out and save yourself a couple thousand bucks getting double windows because you're going to have to put another six solar panels to cover the heat and you're going to need a bigger heating system. So it's worth investing in all those pieces correctly. And we really encourage the starting point is that inner guide label, get a blower door test, measure your home where you're at, just so you see the whole picture of what you have right now and where your big energy losses are. And then you know, with Peter's expertise and our expertise, you get a, a smart pathway forward. Mm -hmm. Are you, is there actually, is the market, when the real estate market seeing value in these types of renovations where you are? It's low, I think I would say. Um, there's, we there's have just, to work hard. Mm -hmm. So I was just gonna say, there's just not enough examples out on the market that have been That's resold right. to really um, 
kind of put a value to it. This is where a place where I think the American system, the U.S. is way ahead of us because they've really, they've mandated that appraisers fill in an energy efficiency form. You know, they're, they, they're obligated to report energy efficiency features when they find them, when they do a, a financial analysis. And we don't have that in Canada. So it's very easy for an appraiser to say, yeah, there's no comparables to your super insulated house, no value. And that's not really fair. Yeah. And then people get scared because they don't know, right? We had to deal with that with our passive house that we sold a couple of years ago, right? And just people are knowing more and more now, but at the time, uh, we, we, you know, we've kind of been putting a lot of stuff out mm-hmm. there for people to know as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess it, it's similar here. It's, it's unfortunate, but you know, hopefully I, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that something starts to change, right? Cause there is, it's to me, like it's, it's the value that you can't necessarily see, but you feel right. When you're mm-hmm. in the house and, and not only just like physically, like sitting by a window or something, but health wise, right. I remember leaving my house going to Florida for three months and coming back and it just smelt my home smelled like fresh wood when I walked into it. Like houses in Florida don't smell like that. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was nice. I'd come back, like I was back and forth, but yeah, after leaving for three or four weeks and coming back to it, it was, it was amazing. It, it gave me mu- that much more appreciation for the home because when you live in it, you don't realize it. But if you leave for an extended period of time, you, you realize how, 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 how much better that home is built. Yeah. It is, and I was actually kind of surprised because, like I mentioned, we kind of did this as an energy thing when we started. Um, but the change in the indoor environment, it's, it's just unbelievable. Like, our house is so well ventilated. We never open any windows. It's 21 degrees in this house, 365 days a year. It's just, it's beautiful to live inside of. You've talked about how quiet the house is now too, right? With the triple glazed windows and that extra insulation, that made a big difference. Oh, for sure. Even uh, like the only time I open my window is when my kids are playing in the backyard so I can hear them. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that adds to the comfort thing too, right? You, you kind of, you have to experience it. You can't like, ex- you can't show people that in a picture, right? It's almost like you need to just, people need to live in it to experience it. And then they, they know, then they realize what they've been missing. I like to compare it to uh, heated seats. I mean, until you've sat in a heated seat, you don't know what you're missing. But once you've had one, it's like, there's no going back, right? Yeah. <laughs> heated steering wheels. Have you had a heated steering yeah. wheel before? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and that's a problem with houses, right? Is you can't take a house for a test drive, right? Like mm-hmm. you want to go, I'd like to take this passive house for a test drive, please. I bring my sleeping bag. Like there's no passive house Airbnb or or show suite that you can spend a weekend in. And so it's so hard to tangibly really get a feel for how different these houses are. Yeah. And, and the, and the issue is that even like a week or something doesn't necessarily give you everything. You have to, you know, experience it for an extended period of time. So you can realize that even throughout the different parts of the season that there, there is, uh, so many benefits you can't experience Mm -hmm. it a weekend or one week. Yeah. Smoke, that's another good one. When it's smoky outside, you can't, can't smell it until you open the door. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed a sound uh, w- when we were living in our house, but that that's, it was less of an issue because we were kind of on the outskirts. But uh, Chris Draca here in Ottawa has a house. That's somebody we work with regularly. He's right beside the road, literally like six feet from the road where he built his house, where the dump trucks have been driving by to dig the tunnels here in Ottawa. And you can't hear the dump trucks when they drive by his house. It's wild, right? But you can't, you can just tell people that, but they don't necessarily believe it. They don't realize how noisy it is until you don't have that noise, right? They're like, oh, this is what it's actually like. (laughs) But what I've also realized is that when it's, it it keeps the sound out, but it also keeps the sound in. So all the sound would just travel throughout our house. Like, great. You could hear across the house, no problem. (laughs) I've heard people complain about their fridge being so loud in these high performance homes and like your fridge hasn't changed but you notice it now because it's the only sound in the house right yeah for sure or if the you know if airflow is too high on something right you know and those are things that uh you you don't really know in your position now you have the experience and you can kind of warn people about that stuff same with us but when you first start getting into it you don't really notice this stuff you don't know that these are issues until you've been in it or lived in it and experienced it there and like oh yeah okay that makes sense <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
uh tyler actually why like why did you bring your before after this we'll get into showing some pictures and and we'll get into the project uh but tyler why did you go the direction of like net zero sustainability energy efficient you know we've been adding we've been looking at the whole field right and, and we really are quite flexible in the programs we want to support everything that's going to move the ball forward in construction and you know, one leads to another, right? So you start talking about, we started as a lead for homes provider because we really liked what lead was saying. And then you say, well, lead isn't quite enough. We need an energy program. And then CHBA comes out with their net zero program. Like, oh, that's that's really going to work. Okay, let's go support that. And passive house, okay, we need to learn about this. And, and so, you know, we've racked up this long list of credentials and programs that we do now just because we keep wanting to see what is going to be the best fit and make sure we can offer the program that's the right fit. You know, we're, we're super ecstatic if a builder wants to do only Energide or only Energy Star because that's where they're at. That's great. We're going to support that. But really, we're looking further down the road and, and we know that the we're heading towards net zero, right? That's the train's leaving the station. That's the end goal here. So uh, we really like what the CHBA has put together here is a program that balances energy performance and comfort and is really looking at envelope and efficiency, uh, mechanical systems, you know, it's not just about solar panels, um, really bringing in the comfort and healthy indoor air quality into a program package. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a great program. So Peter, maybe let's start sharing some pictures and you can take us on a little tour of the house and I'll, I'll ask you questions throughout. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been living in the house or how long were you in the house before you started to plan the renovations? Uh, we bought the house in 2000. So we've been here 15 years uh, before we did anything to it on the exterior. Uh, so this is it in the center of the screen there. Um, a beautiful yellow vinyl siding. <laughs> that is the back um, of the house too. Just that was Here's the, the back of the house. <laughs> Street view. Um, sorry, I'll just jump back to the back. One thing to note that's critical on net zero renovations is upgrading your electrical service. So we were really lucky in that our transformer was directly behind our home. Um, so it didn't cost us as much as it could have um, to upgrade our electrical service. But when you're putting all your heat on electric, the 100 amps that's standard in, in homes just isn't enough. So that's something that has been a challenge in some of the other renovations that we've looked at and something to keep in mind. So when you say it's been a challenge just because it's a significant cost to upgrade? Uh, so it depends. If you have an overhead wire in the backyard, then it's pretty easy to just feed a new wire back to that. Um, if your transformer is two houses down across two driveways, then that's a real problem. That's a $30,000 horizontal drill to, to feed the new wire, right? Right. Um, so just some more pictures of pre-renovation steel framed into the concrete. Um, so something was interesting. We, we built a big double garage in the backyard and uh, even though we were going to disconnect the natural gas, they made us uh, for 2,500 bucks sleeve the gas line back to the house and uh, preserve the connection. Who's there? Just in case. Uh, that was ADCO. Uh, so just in case. Um, so we start by ripping everything off and then we do a uh, liquid applied air barrier. Uh, the first step to the liquid applied air barrier is to tape all the seams. How did, so that's your main air barrier. What, what uh, ACH did you end up getting for the home? I think we're down to uh, 1.27 was the final number. Yeah, that sounds right. Nice. And you, did you do anything to the roof? Or the basement? Uh, well, I mean, we did have a guy uh, crawl around in the attic space and, um, you know, do some caulking and sp spray foam on some of the worst offenders. Um, and then obviously topped up the insulation. But uh, our air barrier strategy is from the exterior. We have minimal number of penetrations. It's, you know, you can see by this picture here, it's basically just paint. Any Almost anybody can do it. Um, so it doesn't have complex overlaps like you do with building paper and so, so to give, uh, I guess, somewhat of uh, something to compare to, Tyler, what would a average home of this age be for ACH? Uh, four air changes at least, you know, probably 1,500 CFM of air leakage when we test it. Because you have a lot of big openings that the fireplace, those old gas fireplaces are terrible. Um, you know, rim joists and a lot of 
mechanical penetrations in these age of house are, are not well detailed. So um, let's just say there'd be lots of air leakage. Yeah, so basically this is like three times better at this point, uh, a little bit better than that. Uh, and uh, the analogy I like to use in this case is like insulation is important, but air sealing is more important. Like if you put a, a down jacket on and you unzip it and face the wind, it doesn't matter how thick the jacket is if you have a big hole in your wall, right? So that, that's, that's essentially what's happening in all these old houses. And this is tighter than most builders in our area are building brand new homes, right? Even a brand new house is probably three air change, two and a half. And a lot of builders don't do air tightness testing still here. Um, so you're still twice as tight as a, as a new house. Um, yeah, based on building code. yeah and there were, there were a few more items involved in that air tightness strategy. Um, we did eliminate all the combustion appliances. So all those vent stacks are gone. There was a wood burning fireplace on this side of the house and we deleted that chimney and that's just a flat wall now. Um, so we did have to get an engineered slab for this garage that was specifically designed to hold as much solar as we could foot, fit on the property. Um, came with a lot of rebar. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of the sitting space further down the road. I uh, used Lux vinyl triple pane windows, so not super high end, but uh, a pretty good value. Um, they're performing really well. You know, they're still warm on the inside when it's really cold outside. Yeah, that's a good point uh, to bring up people to. I have that a lot of conversations around windows and doors with clients. I'm sure you do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get really good performing PVC windows for really good price now. Right? They don't have to. Like I'm, we're doing some windows on projects, and unfortunately, they're still choosing double glaze for some of them that we're doing, um, but they want the aluminum clad wood. And those are more than the triple glaze PVC by far, like double or triple in some cases, right? So just because something performs better doesn't mean it's going to be more expensive. It's, it's a, it's a, is one of the misconceptions I think that, that a lot of people have with this stuff. But there's so much more information on the windows now, because we can really look at that manufacturer specific performance, put it into the computer model, and really tell you how they're performing compared to different manufacturers, right? It's not just looking at two brochures now. We can get very scientific in, in how we pick those windows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's not just the energy performance. Uh, you know, having 20 plus years in exterior contracting, um, wood frame windows really don't weather very well. Um, aluminums get really hot and and they tend to move all over the place these pvcs you know there's lots of room for con uh, contraction and expansion they're white so they don't get super hot um so we're pretty happy with them yeah uh, so you can see the waterproofing on both the uh both of the buildings um, and then we start with the foam. So we used a uh, four inch EPS foam. Um, and basically this is just uh, adhered to the building with a notch trowel. So it's all kind of like tile basically. Um, and you just go around and make sure you get a nice continuous blanket around the entire building. Which system are you using? Did you use for that? Uh, we use STO brand systems. That's STO. Uh, this is the old electrical panel before the uh, service upgrade. Um, in the beginning of the uh, the solar install there, went quite nicely. Uh, so we have micro inverters on this because we did have some um, shading challenges with the house being so close to the garage. Um, so we went for micro inverters to kind of minimize the losses on that. Uh, yeah, it's, re it's surprising how many homeowners don't realize that uh, without the microinverters, your system, your whole array could go down because of one little bit of overhanging branch, right? They don't understand how their system's performing. Mm. So are, are some solar contractors installing it without the microinverters to try and save costs or like why would they do that? There's still a few out there, yeah. And, what, and like what's the cost? Yeah, for of sure. Oh, I would say maybe five to 10% would be my guess. But I, we've had spots where um, an overhead power line didn't get picked up in the shading analysis for the solar. Um, and even just an overhead power line, if it's disrupting three panels 
and you don't have microinverters or optimizers on those, then everything gets degraded because of that little bit of shading. Yeah. When you say degraded, like they get nothing or just significantly reduces? Uh, well, I don't want you to quote me on it, but my understanding is that um, if the, say a 250 watt panel gets shaded down to 150 watts, then everything in that string is down to 150 watts. So if you have 15 or 20 panels on that one string, everything's getting lower production rates without these microinverters. Yeah. Uh, so we have 40 panels on the garage. Um, and then since then we've put another 16 up on the main roof of the home. So that's enough energy for um, the house and most of my wife's car. So uh, the next step after you've got all the styrofoam glued to the house is uh, fiberglass embedded into an acrylic uh, mixed with cement. Um, and that coats the entire surface of the, um, of the insulation. It also gets back wrapped around the back of the piece of EPS. Um, and that's for um, fire reasons. So the fire can't get uh, under and back in behind the EPS and light up. Bugs too. We have some wasps that like to burrow into foam out here and and so you want to make sure there's never any exposed foam edges anywhere. You got to encase everything. Mm -hmm. exactly. Birds. <laughs> Keep the birds out. It's kind of what all our windows are kind of inset like that which worked out pretty well. They're kind of in the middle of the uh, complete insulation barrier. And we're getting a bit closer with uh, some color going on this. And we went with a very light color. Um, I did, really didn't want it, the system to heat up at all. And uh, it just looks awesome. It looks like um, a Greek, almost um, veneer kind of look to it. It's not going to fade at all. You know, That's it's right. going to yeah. hold its color a lot longer. Yeah. Uh, this is the upgraded panel. There's still a few breakers left to throw in here, but this is the uh, 200 amp service. Um, which costs us uh, maybe 7,500 all in. Do you have a picture of your emergency circuit on this one, Peter? I thought that was a good feature you installed. Uh, that is actually on our newest array. Um, so that's a Sunny Boy inverter, um, which has a, what's called a secure power source. So typically, um, if the grid goes down, all the solar has a shut off so that uh, linesmen don't get electrocuted when they're working on your property. Now this uh, particular Sunny Boy inverter has an emergency backup, so you have to manually disconnect it from the grid uh, via two circuits, and then it just gives you like a, a 2000 watt plug. So as long as the sun's shining, you do have some energy. A lot of homeowners we work with don't realize that their big solar array won't provide any resilience because it'll mm -hmm. go down when the grid goes down. And for the small upgrade cost of the Sunny Boy system, now you get a 2000 watt, uh, a circuit, you know, keep the freezer running or, or that kind of thing, right? It's a small feature. It's a small piece, but it's such an important feature. So it's just a circuit. So it's not, is it storing anything? Like it? No, it's a, it's a single 20 amp circuit. So it's, it's just a plug with two outlets right next to the inverter. That's all it is. So if the sun's up, you can pull up to 2000 watts out of it. Right. But if it's not, so at night you would lose the electricity. Correct. It's a great thing for keeping yeah, your without... freezer cold or, or nighttime nice. lighting during an emergency. Or then, I mean, we've had clients, you know, that just get a $50 Canadian tire, you know, eliminator or something like that. Right. And just plug in a, a cheap emergency battery system. Yeah. That's pretty much the finished product. We got one panel left here that wasn't done at this point because we were waiting for the um, mechanical systems to uh, uh, get completed. So you didn't do an addition or anything like that? Other than, I know you did the garage, but the house itself stayed the same shape? That's right. The, the only thing that changed was the chimney got deleted from the one side of the house. Okay. Uh, so this is the Mitsubishi heat pump that uh, we're using in our home. I think it's rated for 35,000 BTUs. Uh, heating and cooling. Um, awesome machine. Keeps the house really comfortable. Um, it does have a backup resistance heater, um, which we typically only turn on when it gets noisy. So at about uh, 15 or 20 below that, Zuba will start making a bit more noise. 
sole uh, clip on the uh, resistance heating to kind of supplement it there. Okay, so the Zuba for our listeners and viewers, Zuba system is a central system, just like a typical furnace, whether it's propane gas or anything like that. But Mitsubishi does the mini splits, which would be separate individual wall mounted or ceiling mounted cassettes or something like that. Yeah, and this one here, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. Uh, this one here is centrally ducted. So we basically just pulled out the existing furnace, used all the existing duct work and just plugged do her handler right into the basement so it's pretty easy it's it is really just a plug and play uh, but again the key is that this unit will only provide up to thirty-five thousand BTUs um, so the building envelope and the heat demand on that building envelope when we're doing new uh, renovations is we're always trying to plan around um, a certain either electrical capacity or a certain size compressor so we, we modify the building envelope components to uh, make sure that we minimize the heat demand on the building. Yeah. And that's the uh, finished product right there. So is your wife involved in this as well in all four or was she just kind of like, Oh, have fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it took quite a bit of trust. Uh, she was, um, I guess six months pregnant when we started planning it. And uh, we had a three month old at home when we were actually doing the construction. So she was pretty patient with me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, sounds familiar actually. When we built our passive house, we bought the lot uh, when my wife was pregnant and yeah, he was born, I was building the house and it was just like, yeah. So I was gone for long hours and uh, yeah, sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. in there mine was a little different because i was still at home when for these uh two or three months and i had all my guys with me too so the house was uh noisy for her and the uh three month old baby right glad it's over i'm sure it's mm -hmm. amazing so thanks so much for walking us through that is that the last picture or did you have more uh, you have more detail I, there i'm not sure oh that's that is the last one right there there we go. Nice. That's great. So is there anything you would have changed at this point now that you're done and you've been through the process and, and learned what's required? Is there anything that you would change, whether it's in the design or in the process or in the products, uh, anything? You uh, really? Your screen too, by the yeah. way, if you sure. Uh, really, the only thing on my home that I would have changed is we only went with a four inch thick EPS. I would do it again with um, at least a six and maybe even as much as a 12 if I was doing my own again. Oh, well, why is that? Uh, 12 inch thick is an R48. I mean, it would take nothing to heat this house. We'd be well into passive house kind of levels. The labor, like most of the cost is in the labor mm -hmm. and that doesn't change really depending on how thick it is, right? So the we often tell clients to go as thick as you can because it's a very smart cost upgrade, right? When you look at the extra cost for that extra inch or two or four, yeah. it's cheap, cheap, cheap compared to uh, the labor. Yeah, when you're gluing the EPS, it gets a bit more complicated if you're using um, a rock sole or bad insulation and you're, you start talking about longer and longer fasteners and yeah. support. But, it gets, but with the EPS, it's just you know a couple extra thousand bucks to get thicker stuff. Would you have been able to do that? Like, did you have any issues with regards to lot lines and, and uh, there, there was on, on one side of our house, um, we would have had to have gone to a non-combustible product, uh, if we were to go to more than four, four inch, uh, which was actually the determining factor for the thickness that we went on this, um, property. That's not typically true. in most of the renovations that we look at, the, the older houses all seem to have five and six feet. Um, but once you get inside that four foot line, uh, there are some fire codes that need to be respected. Yeah. Yeah. We deal with that here too. The other thing too, is we don't do a lot of stucco. So there might be siding or in some cases, especially outside of the city, then maybe there's a covenant and then there's brick or stone and we have to figure out how to carry that. Right. That was one of the issues that we had with our passive houses. We need a lot of insulation, but we want needed to carry brick. 
so we can't, you know, we don't want our foundation to be this thick just to carry the brick. Didn't want to do two foundations to carry the brick. So we ended up with less exterior insulation, uh, a little bit thicker foundation, and then like a double stud wall, which is possible for a, a new construction, right? But renovations would be a completely different story. Then we get into longer fasteners, <laughs> which we're dealing with right now in a project, actually. It's a masonry building and we have to insulate a masonry building and then uh, side put siding on that. So um, what about yourself, Tyler? Anything that you realized that, you know, what went well, what didn't go well? Have you guys learned anything that you've now implemented onto the, in, to the other projects that you've been working on? Um, you know, a lot of our end is, is the administration of the labeling process. And this was an early, early entry into the pilot program. Um, and the program has gotten much better since then. So uh, that's something we definitely are happy to see. Um, labeling a house now is much easier uh, process wise. Um, you know, as a consultant, we are always picking up stuff from our, our builders and our projects. You know, we learned a little bit on the importance of maintenance of these systems from Peter. Um, you know, there, there's actually two filters in these heat pumps that need to be changed. We weren't aware of that. And uh, your electrical bill went a little high there for a, a while, Peter, I think, until we found that second yeah. filter. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, little things like that. Always something to learn, for sure. Yeah, and there's always, and especially with new technology too, right? So, uh, and then more, like all these sub-trades are starting to learn these, these new things as well because they haven't been working with some of this stuff as, as long. So, well, thank you so much for being on the sh show. Congratulations on the accomplishment and being the first in Canada. So that's, uh, I hope you've taken some time to celebrate. <laughs> and cool. uh, yeah, so if people want to get in touch with you, maybe share exactly where you are located, but, uh, and also for both of you, uh, either one of you can start, you know, the best way to get in touch if people have questions or want to work with you, partner, whatever it may be. Yeah, we're out of uh, Calgary, Alberta. We are starting to offer remote uh, consulting options as well. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and you can find us on Google, Solar Homes Inc. And uh, we're at fourelements.eco. Uh, we're based in Calgary as well, and we serve all of Western Canada. Um, great way to get in touch with us through our website or through our social media, or talk to great builders that we work with and they'll direct you our way too. <laughs> well, thanks again, guys. Uh, it's been great. Uh, it's inspiring to see stuff like this happening uh, in Canada, even though it's on the other side of where we are, but it's still uh, something that we can all learn from. So keep it up and uh, we'll looking forward to seeing some of the next projects. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Conscious Builder Show. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and stay up to date with projects like the Three Day Cottage. Uh, that is an exciting project that we have coming up. So we'll catch you on the next episode.